Benedict XV, elected to the papacy less than three months into World War I, made the war and its consequences the main focus of his early pontificate. In stark contrast to his predecessor, five days after his election he spoke of his determination to do what he could to bring peace. His first encyclical, Ad Beatissimi Apostolorum, given November 1, 1914, was concerned with this subject. Benedict XV found his abilities and unique position as a religious emissary of peace ignored by the belligerent powers. The 1915 Treaty of London between Italy and the Triple Entente included secret provisions whereby the Allies agreed with Italy to ignore papal peace moves towards the Central Powers. Consequently, the publication of Benedict's proposed seven-point peace note of August 1917 was roundly ignored by all parties except Austria-Hungary. In Britain in 1914, the Public Schools Officers Training Corps annual camp was held at Tidworth Pennings, near Salisbury Plain. Head of the British Army, Lord Kitchener, was to review the cadets, but the imminence of the war prevented him. General Horace Smith Dorian was sent instead. He surprised the two or three thousand cadets by speaking against the war. Donald Christopher Smith, then cadet, recalled the general said that war should be avoided at almost any cost, that war would solve nothing, that the whole of Europe and more besides would be reduced to ruin, and that the loss of life would be so large that whole populations would be decimated. Donald Smith commented, in our ignorance I, and many of us, felt almost ashamed of a British general who uttered such depressing and unpatriotic sentiments, but during the next four years, those of us who survived the Holocaust, probably not more than one quarter of us, learned how right the general's prognosis was and how courageous he had been to utter it. Voicing these sentiments did not hinder Smith Dorian's career, or prevent him from doing his duty in World War I to the best of his abilities. Many countries jailed those who spoke out against the conflict. These included Eugene Debs in the United States and Bertrand Russell in Britain. In the U.S., the Espionage Act of 1917 and Sedition Act of 1918 made it a federal crime to oppose military recruitment or make any statements deemed disloyal. Publications at all critical of the government were removed from circulation by postal censors, and many served long prison sentences for statements of fact deemed unpatriotic. A number of nationalists opposed intervention, particularly within states that the nationalists were hostile to. Although the vast majority of Irish people consented to participate in the war in 1914 and 1915, a minority of advanced Irish nationalists staunchly opposed taking part. The war began amid the home rule crisis in Ireland that had resurfaced in 1912, and by July 1914 there was a serious possibility of an outbreak of civil war in Ireland. Irish nationalists and Marxists attempted to pursue Irish independence, culminating in the Easter Rising of 1916 with Germany sending 20,000 rifles to Ireland to stir unrest in Britain. The UK government placed Ireland under martial law in response to the Easter Rising, though once the immediate threat of revolution had dissipated, the authorities did try to make concessions to nationalist feeling. However, opposition to involvement in the war increased in Ireland, resulting in the conscription crisis of 1918. Other opposition came from conscientious objectors, some socialist, some religious, who refused to fight. In Britain, 16,000 people asked for conscientious objector status. Some of them, most notably prominent peace activist Stephen Henry Hobhouse, refused both military and alternative service. Many suffered years of prison, including solitary confinement and bread and water diets. Even after the war, in Britain many job advertisements were marked no conscientious objectors need apply. The Central Asian Revolt started in the summer of 1916 when the Russian Empire government ended its exemption of Muslims from military service. In 1917, a series of French army mutinies led to dozens of soldiers being executed and many more imprisoned. On 1 May 4, 1917, about 100,000 workers and soldiers of Petrograd, and after them, the workers and soldiers of other Russian cities, led by the Bolsheviks, demonstrated under banners reading down with the war. And all power to the Soviets. The mass demonstrations resulted in a crisis for the Russian provisional government. In Milan, in May 1917, Bolshevik influence leftists organized and engaged in rioting calling for an end to the war, and managed to close down factories and stop public transportation. The Italian army was forced to enter Milan with tanks and machine guns to face communists and anarchists, who fought violently until 23 May when the army gained control of the city. Almost 50 people, including three Italian soldiers, were killed and over 800 people arrested. In September 1917, Russian soldiers in France began questioning why they were fighting for the French at all and mutinied. In Russia, 
Opposition to the war led to soldiers also establishing their own revolutionary committees, which helped foment the October Revolution of 1917, with the call going up for bread, land, and peace. The Decree on Peace, written by Vladimir Lenin, was passed on November 8, 1917, following the success of the October Revolution. The Bolsheviks agreed to a peace treaty with Germany, the Peace of Brest-Litovsk, despite its harsh conditions. Conscription Conscription was common in most European countries. However, it was controversial in English-speaking countries. It was especially unpopular among minority ethnic groups, especially the Irish Catholics in Ireland and Australia, and the French Catholics in Canada. Canada In Canada the issue produced a major political crisis that permanently alienated the Francophones. It opened a political gap between French Canadians, who believed their true loyalty was to Canada and not to the British Empire, and members of the Anglophone majority, who saw the war as a duty to their British heritage. Australia Australia had a form of conscription at the outbreak of the war, as compulsory military training had been introduced in 1911. However, the Defense Act 1903 provided that unexempted males could be called upon only for home defense during times of war, not overseas service. Prime Minister Billy Hughes wished to amend the legislation to require conscripts to serve overseas, and held two non-binding referendums, one in 1916 and one in 1917, in order to secure public support. Both were defeated by narrow margins, with farmers, the labor movement, the Catholic Church, and Irish Australians combining to campaign for the no vote. The issue of conscription caused the 1916 Australian Labour Party split. Hughes and his supporters were expelled from the party, forming the National Labour Party and then the Nationalist Party. Despite the referendum results, the Nationalists won a landslide victory at the 1917 federal election. Britain In Britain, conscription resulted in the calling up of nearly every physically fit man in Britain, 6 of 10 million eligible. Of these, about 750,000 lost their lives. Most deaths were those of young unmarried men, however, 160,000 wives lost husbands and 300,000 children lost fathers. Conscription during the First World War began when the British government passed the Military Service Act in 1916. The act specified that single men aged 18 to 40 years old were liable to be called up for military service unless they were widowed with children or ministers of a religion. There was a system of military service tribunals to adjudicate upon claims for exemption upon the grounds of performing civilian work of national importance, domestic hardship, health, and conscientious objection. The law went through several changes before the war ended. Married men were exempt in the original act, although this was changed in June 1916. The age limit was also eventually raised to 51 years old. Recognition of work of national importance also diminished and in the last year of the war there was some support for the conscription of clergy. Conscription lasted until mid-1919. Due to the political situation in Ireland, conscription was never applied there, only in England, Scotland and Wales. United States In the United States, conscription began in 1917 and was generally well received, with a few pockets of opposition in isolated rural areas. The administration decided to rely primarily on conscription, rather than voluntary enlistment, to raise military manpower for when only 73,000 volunteers enlisted out of the initial 1 million target in the first six weeks of the war. In 1917 10 million men were registered. This was deemed to be inadequate, so age ranges were increased and exemptions reduced, and so by the end of 1918 this increased to 24 million men that were registered with nearly 3 million inducted into the military services. The draft was universal and included blacks on the same terms as whites, although they served in different units. In all 367,710 black Americans were drafted, 13% of the total, compared to 2,442,586 white, 87%. Forms of resistance ranged from peaceful protests to violent demonstrations and from humble letter-writing campaigns asking for mercy to radical newspapers demanding reform. The most common tactics were dodging and desertion, and many communities sheltered and defended their draft dodgers as political heroes. Many socialists were jailed for obstructing the recruitment or enlistment service. The most famous was Eugene Debs, head of the Socialist Party of America, who ran for president in 1920 from his prison cell. In 1917 a number of radicals and anarchists challenged the new draft law in federal court, arguing that it was a direct violation of the 13th Amendment's prohibition against slavery and involuntary servitude. 
The Supreme Court unanimously upheld the constitutionality of the Draft Act and the Selective Draft Law cases on January 7, 1918. Austria-Hungary Like all the armies of mainland Europe, Austria-Hungary relied on conscription to fill its ranks. Officer recruitment, however, was voluntary. The effect of this at the start of the war was that over 40% of the rank and file were Slavs, while more than 75% of the officers were ethnic Germans. This was much resented. The army has been described as being run on colonial lines and the Slav soldiers as disaffected. Thus conscription contributed greatly to Austria's disastrous performance on the battlefield. Diplomacy The non-military diplomatic and propaganda interactions among the nations were designed to build support for the cause, or to undermine support for the enemy. For the most part, wartime diplomacy focused on five issues, propaganda campaigns, defining and redefining the war goals, which became harsher as the war went on, luring neutral nations, Italy, Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Romania, into the coalition by offering slices of enemy territory, and encouragement by the allies of nationalistic minority movements inside the central powers, especially among Czechs, Poles, and Arabs. In addition, there were multiple peace proposals coming from neutrals, or one side or the other, none of them progressed very far. Legacy and Memory Dot. Strange. Friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years. Wilfred Owen, Strange Meeting, 1918. The war was an unprecedented triumph for natural science. Francis, Bacon had promised that knowledge would be power, and power it was, power to destroy the bodies and souls of men more rapidly than had ever been done by human agency before. This triumph paved the way to other triumphs, improvements in transport, in sanitation, in surgery, medicine, and psychiatry, in commerce and industry, and, above all, in preparations for the next war. R. G. Collingwood, writing in 1939. The first tentative efforts to comprehend the meaning and consequences of modern warfare began during the initial phases of the war, and this process continued throughout and after the end of hostilities, and is still underway, more than a century later. Historiography. Historian Heather Jones argues that the historiography has been reinvigorated by the cultural turn in recent years. Scholars have raised entirely new questions regarding military occupation, radicalization of politics, race, and the male body. Furthermore, new research has revised our understanding of five major topics that historians have long debated, why the war began, why the Allies won, whether generals were responsible for high casualty rates, how the soldiers endured the horrors of trench warfare, and to what extent the civilian home front accepted and endorsed the war effort. Memorials Memorials were erected in thousands of villages and towns. Close to battlefields, those buried in improvised burial grounds were gradually moved to formal graveyards under the care of organizations such as the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, the American Battle Monuments Commission, the German War Graves Commission, and Le Souvenir Francais. Many of these graveyards also have central monuments to the missing or unidentified dead, such as the Menin Gate Memorial and the Thiepful Memorial to the Missing of the Somme. In 1915 John McRae, a Canadian Army doctor, wrote the poem in Flanders Fields as a salute to those who perished in the Great War. Published in Punch on December 8, 1915, it is still recited today, especially on Remembrance Day and Memorial Day. National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, Missouri, is a memorial dedicated to all Americans who served in World War I. The Liberty Memorial was dedicated on November 1, 1921, when the Supreme Allied Commander spoke to a crowd of more than 100,000 people. The UK government has budgeted substantial resources to the commemoration of the war during the period 2014 to 2018. The lead body is the Imperial War Museum. On August 3, 2014, French President François Hollande and German President Joachim Gauck together marked the centenary of Germany's declaration of war on France by laying the first stone of a memorial in Vieux Armand, known in German as Hartmannswillerkopf, for French and German soldiers killed in the war. Cultural Memory World War I had a lasting impact on social memory. It was seen by many in Britain as signaling the end of an era of stability stretching back to the Victorian period, and across Europe many regarded it as a watershed. Historian Samuel Hines explained. A generation of innocent young men, their heads full of high abstractions like honor, glory and England, went off to war to make the world safe for democracy. They were slaughtered in stupid battles planned by stupid generals. Those who survived were shocked, 
disillusioned and embittered by their war experiences, and saw that their real enemies were not the Germans, but the old men at home who had lied to them. They rejected the values of the society that had sent them to war, and in doing so separated their own generation from the past and from their cultural inheritance. This has become the most common perception of World War I, perpetuated by the art, cinema, poems, and stories published subsequently. Films such as All Quiet on the Western Front, Paths of Glory and King and Country have perpetuated the idea, while wartime films including Comrades, Poppies of Flanders, and Shoulder Arms indicate that the most contemporary views of the war were overall far more positive. Likewise, the art of Paul Nash, John Nash, Christopher Nevinson, and Henry Tonks in Britain painted a negative view of the conflict in keeping with the growing perception, while popular wartime artists such as Muirhead Bone painted more serene and pleasant interpretations subsequently rejected as inaccurate. Several historians like John Terrain, Neil Ferguson and Gary Sheffield have challenged these interpretations as partial and polemical views. These beliefs did not become widely shared because they offered the only accurate interpretation of wartime events. In every respect, the war was much more complicated than they suggest. In recent years, historians have argued persuasively against almost every popular cliché of World War I. It has been pointed out that, although the losses were devastating, their greatest impact was socially and geographically limited. The many emotions other than horror experienced by soldiers in and out of the front line, including comradeship, boredom, and even enjoyment, have been recognized. The war is not now seen as a fight about nothing, but as a war of ideals, a struggle between aggressive militarism and more or less liberal democracy. It has been acknowledged that British generals were often capable men facing difficult challenges, and that it was under their command that the British army played a major part in the defeat of the Germans in 1918, a great forgotten victory. Though these views have been discounted as myths, they are common. They have dynamically changed according to contemporary influences, reflecting in the 1950s perceptions of the war at endless following the contrasting Second World War and emphasizing conflict within the ranks during times of class conflict in the 1960s. The majority of additions to the contrary are often rejected. Social trauma The social trauma caused by unprecedented rates of casualties manifested itself in different ways, which have been the subject of subsequent historical debate. The optimism of La Belle Epoque was destroyed, and those who had fought in the war were referred to as the lost generation. For years afterwards, people mourned the dead, the missing, and the many disabled. Many soldiers returned with severe trauma, suffering from shell shock, also called neurasthenia, a condition related to post-traumatic stress disorder. Many more returned home with few after-effects, however, their silence about the war contributed to the conflict's growing mythological status. Though many participants did not share in the experiences of combat or spend any significant time at the front, or had positive memories of their service, the images of suffering and trauma became the widely shared perception. Such historians as Dan Todman, Paul Fussell, and Samuel Hines have all published works since the 1990s arguing that these common perceptions of the war are factually incorrect. Discontent in Germany The rise of Nazism and fascism included a revival of the nationalist spirit and a rejection of many post-war changes. Similarly, the popularity of the stab in the back legend, German, Dolstas legend, was a testament to the psychological state of defeated Germany and was a rejection of responsibility for the conflict. This conspiracy theory of betrayal became common, and the German populace came to see themselves as victims. The widespread acceptance of the stab in the back theory delegitimized the Weimar government and destabilized the system, opening it to extremes of right and left. Communist and fascist movements around Europe drew strength from this theory and enjoyed a new level of popularity. These feelings were most pronounced in areas directly or harshly affected by the war. Adolf Hitler was able to gain popularity by using German discontent with the still controversial Treaty of Versailles. World War II was in part a continuation of the power struggle never fully resolved by World War I. Furthermore, it was common for Germans in the 1930s to justify acts of aggression due to perceived injustices imposed by the victors of World War I. American historian William Rubinstein wrote that. The age of totalitarianism included nearly all the infamous examples of genocide in modern history, headed by the Jewish Holocaust, but also comprising the mass murders and purges of the communist world, other mass killings carried out by Nazi Germany and its allies, and also the Armenian Genocide of 1915. All these slaughters, it is argued here, had a common origin, the collapse of the elite structure and normal modes of government of much of Central, Eastern and Southern Europe as a result of World War I, 
without which surely neither communism nor fascism would have existed except in the minds of unknown agitators and crackpots. Economic Effects One of the most dramatic effects of the war was the expansion of governmental powers and responsibilities in Britain, France, the United States, and the dominions of the British Empire. To harness all the power of their societies, governments created new ministries and powers. New taxes were levied and laws enacted, all designed to bolster the war effort, many have lasted to this day. Similarly, the war strained the abilities of some formerly large and bureaucratized governments, such as in Austria, Hungary and Germany. Gross domestic product, GDP, increased for three allies, Britain, Italy, and the United States, but decreased in France and Russia, in neutral Netherlands, and in the three main central powers. The shrinkage in GDP in Austria, Russia, France, and the Ottoman Empire ranged between 30% and 40%. In Austria, for example, most pigs were slaughtered, so at war's end there was no meat. In all nations, the government's share of GDP increased, surpassing 50% in both Germany and France and nearly reaching that level in Britain. To pay for purchases in the United States, Britain cashed in its extensive investments in American railroads and then began borrowing heavily from Wall Street. President Wilson was on the verge of cutting off the loans in late 1916, but allowed a great increase in U.S. government lending to the Allies. After 1919, the U.S. demanded repayment of these loans. The repayments were, in part, funded by German reparations that, in turn, were supported by American loans to Germany. This circular system collapsed in 1931 and some loans were never repaid. Britain still owed the United States $4.4 billion of World War I debt in 1934, the last installment was finally paid in 2015. Macro and microeconomic consequences devolved from the war. Families were altered by the departure of many men. With the death or absence of the primary wage earner, women were forced into the workforce in unprecedented numbers. At the same time, industry needed to replace the lost laborers sent to war. This aided the struggle for voting rights for women. World War I further compounded the gender imbalance, adding to the phenomenon of surplus women. The deaths of nearly one million men during the war in Britain increased the gender gap by almost a million, from 670,000 to 1,700,000. The number of unmarried women seeking economic means grew dramatically. In addition, Demobilization and economic decline following the war caused high unemployment. The war increased female employment, however, the return of demobilized men displaced many from the workforce, as did the closure of many of the wartime factories. In Britain, rationing was finally imposed in early 1918, limited to meat, sugar, and fats, butter and margarine, but not bread. The new system worked smoothly. From 1914 to 1918, trade union membership doubled, from a little over 4 million to a little over 8 million. Britain turned to her colonies for help in obtaining essential war materials whose supply from traditional sources had become difficult. Geologists such as Albert Ernest Kitson were called on to find new resources of precious minerals in the African colonies. Kitson discovered important new deposits of manganese, used in munitions production, in the Gold Coast. Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, the so-called War Guilt Clause, Stated Germany accepted responsibility for all the loss and damage to which the Allied and associated governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. It was worded as such to lay a legal basis for reparations, and a similar clause was inserted in the treaties with Austria and Hungary. However neither of them interpreted it as an admission of war guilt. In 1921, the total reparation sum was placed at 132 billion gold marks. However, Allied experts knew that Germany could not pay this sum. The total sum was divided into three categories, with the third being deliberately designed to be chimerical and its primary function was to mislead public opinion into believing the total sum was being maintained. Thus, 50 billion gold marks, $12.5 billion, represented the actual Allied assessment of German capacity to pay and therefore represented the total German reparations figure that had to be paid. This figure could be paid in cash or in kind, coal, timber, chemical dyes, etc. In addition, some of the territory lost, via the Treaty of Versailles, was credited towards the reparation figure as were other acts such as helping to restore the Library of Louvain. By 1929, the Great Depression arrived, causing political chaos throughout the world. In 1932 the payment of reparations was suspended by the international community, 
by which point Germany had paid only the equivalent of 20.598 billion gold marks in reparations. With the rise of Adolf Hitler, all bonds and loans that had been issued and taken out during the 1920s and early 1930s were cancelled. David Andelman notes refusing to pay doesn't make an agreement null and void. The bonds, the agreement, still exist. Thus, following the Second World War, at the London Conference in 1953, Germany agreed to resume payment on the money borrowed. On October 3, 2010, Germany made the final payment on these bonds. The war contributed to the evolution of the wristwatch from women's jewelry to a practical everyday item, replacing the pocket watch, which requires a free hand to operate. Military funding of advancements in radio contributed to the post-war popularity of the medium.